Labor and the LNP pick candidates for the Fadden by-election as the federal opposition looks for its first electoral win in more than 12 months. The Greens offer a compromise on the Albanese government's signature housing bill, calling for action to coordinate a national freeze on rent increases. Forlack continues after three ex-Hawthorne players named themselves as complainants in the ongoing racism saga at the club. And Aussie batsman David Warner reveals ahead of the Ashes that he's planning to retire from Test cricket during the upcoming home summer. Good evening, let's begin this hour with the latest from the Fadden by-election campaign in Queensland. Both Labor and the Liberal Nationals have announced their candidates, with the federal opposition looking for their first electoral win in more than 12 months. Odds appear to be favouring the LNP, but Peter Dutton says his party isn't taking anything for granted after their historic by-election loss just a few months ago in Aston. Port Lincoln Holmes has the details. After an historic loss in Aston, the federal opposition is now looking for its first electoral win in more than a year. Uh, we've chosen an excellent candidate, a local candidate, and somebody who's well credentialed uh, to fight hard on behalf of the people of Fadden. Gold Coast Councillor Cameron Cadwell, pre-selected by the Liberal Nationals to contest the Fadden by-election following the resignation of former Government Minister Stuart Robert. Fadden is currently held by the LNP on a 10.6% margin. Labor has only held the seat briefly since it was created in 1977. Hi there, my name's Letitia Del Fabro and I'm Labor's candidate for the electorate of Fadden here in the central and northern Gold Coast. Even though the odds aren't in their favour, they will be contesting. Also running are the Citizens Party and two independents. And Six News also understands the Greens and One Nation are set to contest. We uh, don't take anything for granted. We'll be working hard and uh, I believe we can win the seat. But for the ALP to win, they will need a lot of things to go right for them. An important step will be bringing the LNP primary vote within six or so percentage of their own. At this point, Labor will be with a chance of winning on preferences from the Greens and potentially even One Nation. Labor also has the issue of a very low primary vote. Polling just 22%, the party has a steep hill to climb if they want to get even close to the LNP primary vote of 45%. The last time they won a vote share above 30 was in 2007 when Kevin Rudd led the party to a federal election victory. Voters will head to the polls on July 15. Lincoln Holmes, 6 News. The Greens have offered a compromise on the Albanese government's signature housing bill. The party's housing spokesperson, Max chandler Mather is now calling on Labor to take action to coordinate a national freeze on rent increases and ongoing rent caps and guarantee a minimum $2.5 billion a year spent directly on public community and affordable housing beginning now. That is half of their original demand of $5 billion. A, it's not clear it's going to build more housing. B, of course we go into a negotiation with the possibility that we might vote it down. It's not much of a negotiation. But our point to the government is this is one of the worst housing crises in this country's history. If they can find $30 billion a year for the stage three tax cuts that see every politician get $9,000 a year, why can't they find $2.5 billion uh, for public and affordable housing and a $1 billion for a freeze on rent increases? But is, How do you explain that? Labor has said it has met the demands of crossbenchers when it comes to their Housing Australia Future Fund. The Prime Minister says any announcements on fresh support for Ukraine will be made when they're ready to be made. Anthony Albanese will be attending the NATO conference in July with speculation new support for Ukraine will be announced then. That follows a tweet from Ukraine's Defence Minister after he met Aussie counterpart Richard Miles that claimed another package of security assistance would be announced by the federal government in July. Miles was also asked to consider the possibility of training Ukrainian pilots, provide medical evacuation vehicles and means of electronic warfare against drones. 
Four lakh continues from the racism saga at the Hawthorne Hawks after three ex-players went public naming themselves as complainants in the investigation. Hawthorne coach Sam Mitchell, who played at the same time as Cyril Rioli, Carl Peterson and Jermaine Miller-Lewis, says he feels for everyone linked to the situation. National reporter Austin Pollock has more. Well, in another dramatic development in the Hawthorne racism allegation saga, several players and their families who claim to have experienced racism at their time at the Hawthorne Footy Club under the leadership of coaches Chris Fagan and Alistair Clarkson, along with welfare manager Jason Burt, have gone public. Among those speaking out are four-time premiership player Cyril Rioli and his wife Shannon, player Carl Peterson, Jermaine Miller-Lewis and his wife Montana, as well as former staffer and Indigenous advisor Leon Egan. These revelations have emerged just days after the AFL officially announced that after an extensive independent review, no adverse findings were found against the former coaches and manager. I want to say that for the moment, the Hawthorne Football Club's Bin Mata report was leaked without any opportunity for input from the persons against whom serious allegations were made. It has been a period of high distress for all parties. No adverse findings have been made in the independent investigation against any of the individuals against whom allegations have been made. In an open letter released on Friday, the families who prompted the Hawthorne Review expressed their disappointment, stating, We are some of the Indigenous families who endured racism at the Hawthorne Football Club. We were separated from our families. We were told an unborn child would ruin our futures. We told our truths in confidence because we believed that it would bring change and because we needed to heal and move on. That confidence was betrayed. The complainants will now take their fight to the Human Rights Commission. The whole process of investigation by Hawthorne and the AFL described as a shit show. This whole scandal coming to light following an investigation into the original allegations by Hawthorne. At the conclusion of that, a report was handed to the AFL Integrity Commission. Before this was leaked to the media, all the allegations coming to the forefront of the sporting world off the back of an ABC article, according to former Hawks president, Jeff Kennett. We got a complaint in April last year by uh, the Rioli family about the relationship they had with the Hawthorne Football Club. That surprised us. That report was leaked. That is when this whole thing has gone off the road. Integrity with Hawthorne would have gone to the three and said, look, these accusations have been made. Uh, do they have any substance? And then we'd decide what we're going to do with it. But once it went public, we had a firestorm. It's important to note that all three of the accused have repeatedly and vigorously denied the allegations. Only one of the accused so far have hit back. Jason Burt saying the complainants were seeking financial compensation and he was happy to take part in any legal proceedings. Parramatta Eel star Dylan Brown has been charged with sexually touching another person following an incident at a Sydney hotel. New South Wales police say they arrested the NRL player and charged him with sexually touching another person without consent overnight. He was granted bail and will be due in court on June the 7th. In a statement, the Eels say they have been aware of an incident involving Brown. As it is a police matter, the club will not be making any further comment at this time. U.S. President Joe Biden has signed a bill suspending the government's $31.4 trillion debt ceiling, avoiding what would have been a default. The Treasury Department had warned it would be unable to pay all its bills on Monday if no action was taken by Congress before then. On Twitter, Biden said America had averted an economic crisis and collapse, saying the government is cutting spending and bringing deficits down. More Republicans are set to enter the race for GOP 2024 presidential nomination. Among them is Donald Trump's former vice president, Mike Pence. North American correspondent White Sharp has more. Iowa Senator Joni Ernst's annual Roast and Ride celebration taking place over the weekend, attracting former Vice President Mike Pence, who is said to be considering a bid for the White House. That doesn't say I'm running for president. I don't know what is. Are you ready to make it official? <laughs> well, we're looking forward to being back in Iowa next Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. You know, Karen and I spent a lot of time over the last two years reflecting and frankly praying about uh, where we might uh, Next serve our country after our years in Congress, our years as governor of Indiana, and years as vice president. Pence is set to make his campaign announcement official on Wednesday, but he's already facing criticism from the likes of former President Donald Trump, the two who drifted ways after the January 6th insurrection. Mike Pence, I hope you're going to stand up 
for the good of our Constitution and for the good of our country. And if you're not, I'm going to be very disappointed in you. I will tell you right now. Pence isn't the only candidate set to announce. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie will also make it official on Tuesday. So certainly, Leo, the criteria for the debate has been released. And one of the criteria for the debate is that you have to have 40,000 unique donors in order to be a participant in the debate. Some of these candidates are already well over that and well on their way to achieving that. Of course, Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, you know, Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy. There's a lot of these candidates who have already announced, for example, you saw Vivek Ramaswamy, who's a small businessman, doesn't have a lot of name recognition as of this point in time. Even someone like him uh, was able to get that. I think his campaign released a statement saying that they have about 43,000 unique donors and you need to get over 40,000 by the day of the debate. So there's a lot of time for a lot of the campaigns to get there. But you have a lot of campaigns complaining that perhaps the debate criteria is too far and that it won't allow maximum participation. Asa Hutchinson, who was the governor of Arkansas, he was an official in George W. Bush's administration. His campaign put out a statement saying that they believe the rules that were set out for the debate and the criteria uh, will not allow maximum participation in the debate. A lot of people pointing out perhaps his campaign is not certain that they will themselves be able to participate in the debate because they are not close to that 40,000 number and perhaps they don't feel very confident that they can get to that 40,000 number by the time the day of the debate takes place. Of course, as we've been discussing, former Vice President Mike Pence is set to announce that he is running for president. People like him will likely not have any you know, issues whatsoever getting on that debate stage, but there will likely be some other folks. Um, of course, the longer you announce, you know, someone like Chris Christie in 2016, he was not very successful. In, in fact, he was a very long shot away from getting the nomination, likely not going to be successful again this time around. Um, and so really, the longer someone like Chris Christie waits to announce, he's announcing on Tuesday, the chances of him being able to get that amount of donors, 40,000 unique donors to participate in that debate are therefore shrinking increasingly because of the fact that his campaign has a shorter amount of time to get to those 40,000 unique donors. All right, White Sharp, thank you. Roger Cook is said to be sworn in formally as the new Premier of Western Australia following the sudden resignation of Mark McGowan. <laughs> Questions are now being raised by some about whether Victorian Premier Dan Andrews will be next to go. Political editor Roman McKinnon explains. Following the shock resignation of Western Australian Premier Mark McGowan, some people are now asking the question, who else is next? Of the eight Premiers and Chief Ministers who gained a national profile through COVID press conferences in 2020 and 2021, only three remain. Michael Gunner and Peter Gutwin quit. Stephen Marshall lost 2022 South Australian election. Gladys Berejiklian resigned and was replaced by Dominic Perrottet, who also recently lost in the New South Wales election. And now McGowan is gone as well. This only leaves Victorian Premier Dan Andrews, Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk and ACT Chief Minister Andrew Barr. Andrews and Barr have been serving for near identical periods of time while Palaszczuk was elected a year after in 2015. But are any of them actually going to go? Barr said in an interview last year that while he won't still be leading after 25 or 30 years, he does intend to contest the 2024 territory election and won't step down in the foreseeable future. As it stands, he will become the longest serving chief minister in the territory's history by the end of this term. Palaszczuk won't be surpassing that record in Queensland anytime soon, but if she stays in office until the 2024 state election, which some think Labor will lose, she will have surpassed Peter Beattie as the fourth longest serving leader. It's worth noting Beattie himself had a succession plan with Anna Bly taking over following his retirement in 2007. 
But Andrews doesn't face election until 2026. A day after last year's election, he said he wouldn't quit in this term. In February, he said the same thing, and he said it once again after McGowan's decision. This would make Andrews the second longest serving Premier in Victoria. And while Queensland Labor could lose in 2024, Victoria, the ACT and WA appear much more likely to stay in Labor's control. Roger Cook will officially be sworn in as the 31st Premier in the coming days. And as that ongoing fallout continues from Mark McGowan's resignation less than two years out from the next WA state election, Six News spoke to Dr Blair Williams. She is a lecturer of Australian politics at Monash University. Started off by asking about some of what we can expect for WA Labor now that McGowan is gone. Considering there's not really an opposition party in WA, it's a pretty safe bet. Obviously, I mean, uh, it'd be... You can't really go up from where the Labor Party is. There's not many seats they can win, uh, considering they have most of them. So they can only really go down, but that would still be in the majority. So I predict that, you know, they would probably win unless they put in a horrific leader for the next two years. But it's looking pretty likely they'll win. And, uh, of course, McGowan, he's not just going from Premier, but he's going from Parliament. Uh, his seat of Rockingham will be up for a by-election sometime this year. Um, based on that huge margin, something like 37%, um, seems that, that that should be an easy return. And also considering I think Labor's always held the seat as well before even McGowan. Yeah, since its existence. I mean, only two people have held the seat, and one of them is McGowan since 1996. So uh, I was a toddler at that age. This is before you were born. It's a long time that they've held that. Um, and like most seats in the state, uh, you know, they hold it by massive margins. And that only went up in the last election. I'm sure it won't be perhaps as huge because we know, that, you know, the kind of personality cult of McGowan. Um, but it is a pretty safe Labour seat. So the by-election looks pretty promising for the Labour Party as well. The McGowan resignation was such a shock. So I was like, he'll, he'll be in that for a while. And, you know, it looks like Dan Andrews will be in, you know, um, as Premier for a while as well. But who can say, right? Because it's such an exhausting job to have, um, even if you have these massive majorities, even if you've had a pretty swell time, if you can say that for COVID, it probably, you know, it's not exactly a great time. But even at the best of circumstances, it's a pretty tiring job. Um, so, and those leaders have had to navigate through ridiculously tough times as well, you know, particularly with Dan Andrews and, and the kind of polarised hate he received um, during uh, the, the the worst parts of the pandemic. Um, so it remains to be seen, I think. Uh, currently, it looks, I mean, at, at least for Andrews, it looks like he'll stay around for, for a while. It'll be interesting to see what happens up in Queensland as well. It's just really hard to tell. Um you know, the, 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 the levels of exhaustion that these um, premiers are facing. Dr. Blair Williams from Monash University there. Changing pace now, let's get the latest in sport and the Central Coast Mariners have won the A-League Men's Championship with a 6-1 win over Melbourne City. Jason Cummings starred during the game with a hat-trick in front of more than 26,000 spectators who watched the game at Combank, Sta Combank Stadium in Western Sydney. It is the Mariners' second ever win and the biggest grand final win in the A-League since Melbourne victory defeated Adelaide United 6-0 in 2007. Aussie batsman David Warner has revealed he's planning to retire from Test cricket during the upcoming home season. It comes ahead of the Ashes series beginning in England with questions over the opener's recent performances. Senior reporter Darby Travers has more. David Warner has confirmed his plans to retire at the end of the upcoming home summer. Warner told reporters that he wants his final game to be at the SCG against Pakistan this coming January, but he will still play white ball cricket until the 2024 T20 World Cup, which he says will probably be his final games. Warner's test career has so far seen him compete in 103 matches, with more than 9,000 total runs scored, including 25 centuries and 34 half centuries. His highest score was against Pakistan in 2019, with 335 not out. His performance has come into question in more recent months, however, even after his double century during the Boxing Day test against South Africa in December, 
That was the only time he passed 50 in his most recent 15 test innings as of February this year. Warner recently headed home from India early after suffering an elbow fraction, forcing him to miss the final two tests. He told reporters then it's a bit sore, but now is okay. The first Ashes test begins on June 16 and lasts right through until the end of July. All right, let's now check in with Ivan Melly with a look what's making news right now on WAMN News. Thanks, Leo. Tonight on WAMN News, they don't speak for me. Leading grassroots activist elaborates further on his stance after switching from voting no to yes. An exclusive interview coming up. Also tonight, the end of the McGowan era. What's next for our state as Roger Cook takes over as WA's new premier? Almost 100 kilometres over the speed limit. Police speed camera operation targets reckless drivers on WA roads. Plus, second time is the charm. Sandy Angie competes against Basil Zemplis, the Perth's Lord Mayorship. And later, Dr Andrew Miller's comment. Join us tonight on the WMN News Facebook page and YouTube channel. All right, a reminder of the top stories we are following on Six News this hour, and both Labor and the Liberal Nationals have announced their candidates for the Fadden by-election, with the federal opposition looking for their first electoral win in more than 12 months. Odds appear to be favouring the LNP, but Peter Dutton says his party isn't taking anything for granted after their historic Aston by-election loss just a few months ago. And the Greens have offered a compromise on the Albanese government's signature housing bill. The party's housing spokesperson, Max Chandler-Mather, is calling on Labor to take action to coordinate a national freeze on rent increases and ongoing rent caps and guarantee a minimum of 2.5 billion spent directly on public housing. And that is Six News for this hour. There is more news 24-7 on our website, sixnewsau.com, and on social media. Just search Six News AU to find us. More news coverage does continue right after this. For now, though, I'm Leonardo Puglisi. Thanks for your company. Good night. <laughs>